plus IF50, it's an ethnic group. So, <laughs> advantages in uh, redefining uh, curators as such because there are you know, laws that protect against uh, offending ethnic groups um, based on racial discrimination, which I think is kind of something that the curator would need um, uh, with a matter of urgency. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so next is, uh, I think Helen Hughes is the next. Uh, Helen Hughes is a curator and writer from Gertrude Street Con Contemporary, actually just called Gertrude Contemporary at the moment. <coughs> and so she joined us here in the Wild West to uh, uh, present, um, I assume, uh, a perspective slightly different from, from our own local uh, Western perspective. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, I'm very grateful to Rachel and Lisa and everyone at Paper Mountain for the invitation to speak today. It's my first time in Perth and um, my first time on Noongar country and I acknowledge that we are on what always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So even though I'm from Melbourne, uh, so many of my favourite artists are from Perth, uh, artists who live there. Um, as Marco mentioned, I'm a curator at the moment at Gertrude Contemporary, where we currently have a show by David Egan. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing George Egerton Warburton next weekend, because he's returning to uh, Melbourne from LA to take part in ACCA's annual exhibition, New. Um, at first, I was a bit surprised when I was invited to take part in a symposium on uh, artist run initiatives, because I've technically never been part of one. I'm not an artist or a writer, uh, sorry, I'm not an artist, but a writer, a researcher. Uh, editor and publisher. I've actually, this is, it's a bit of an um, anomaly that I'm in a role of curator at the moment because I've never really been a curator either. I'm just filling in for the excellent Pip Wallace while she's uh, you know, away for a year. Um, <clears throat> so when Rachel explained that it was my work on the journal Discipline that I co-edit um, and co-founded, that she was specifically interested in me speaking about today, I knew it was the spirit of independence that she was specifically interested in channeling. So I thought today I'd explain what discipline is, how it started, and how it operates independently today uh, as my contribution to this panel on criticism and curatorial practice. Uh, so most people here probably won't know what discipline is because it's frequently and probably fairly derided as Melbourne-centric. Um, discipline was born out of a, a reading, a postgraduate art history reading group that we used to run uh, at Melbourne University. Um, in fact, it still runs, it's called MACA, or Modern and Contemporary Art Reading Group. And uh, I guess the idea for it began when we did a big group reading of Terry Smith's 2009 book, What is Contemporary Art? I imagine most of you are pretty familiar with this book. Um, in it, he sort of tries to define or correct, like taxonomize um, the three key forces of contemporaneity. So what are the conditions of contemporary society? Which I think from memory, he says uh, globalization, uh, the image economy and um, post-colonialism and the processes of decolonization. And then he tries to map onto those conditions of contemporaneity, three sort of streams of contemporary art. So he's, you know, Terry Smith is an art historian obsessed with taxonomizing principles. And this is what he does in the book. So uh, when we read this book as a group, we started to think about, um, you know, how might we alternatively theorize the conditions of contemporaneity and also uh, the, you know, what's characteristic of contemporary art as a phenomenon that is distinct from modernism or postmodernism. Um, and in this reading group, we read other books as well, kind of on the topic, like we read a lot of Boris Groys, we read Rosalind Krauss's uh, most recent book, Under Blue Cup, which is pretty hilarious, Peter Osborne's um, recent and very dense book, Anywhere um, or Not at All, Philosophy of Contemporary Art, and, um, you know, many texts by Claire Bishop and people like this. So, uh, catalyzed by this group reading of what is contemporary art, or WICA, as we came to call it by its acronym, um, <laughs> discipline has always been devoted to sort of theorizing contemporary art beyond just merely saying contemporary art is pluralistic, i.e. contemporary art is radically heterogeneous. And we try and think about it um, as distinct from postmodernism, you know, anything goes. And we also try and think about it as distinct from globalization, even though uh, contemporary art as a global industry is obviously um, deeply inflected and structured by processes of globalization, 
we tend to think that is you know, still distinct from that uh, phenomenon. I wouldn't say we've arrived at a theory of contemporary art, but we're definitely in the process of developing one. So to explain the structure of discipline a bit, um, because we are based in Melbourne, or at least we were until Nick Cochran, my co-editor, moved to New York to do his PhD, um, so is discipline. So because we are based in Melbourne, so is discipline. That is to say that the edi editorial focus of discipline is on contemporary art from Melbourne, not because contemporary art from Melbourne is uh, exceptional or even especially interesting in any way, but rather because um, the editors, um, myself and Nicholas Coggan, and another colleague of ours, David Homewood, who recently joined us, come from and live in Melbourne, and therefore Melbourne is the logical place from which to begin an analysis of contemporary art as a sort of global uh, phenomenon, I guess. Um, for us, insofar as we would venture to give a definition of contemporary art, it's very much about the shuttling between a local and a global context. This is why we include in each issue a guest edited section by a writer or curator or editor or artist based somewhere else in the world. So these are our three issues up here. Um, in the first issue, we had a Brisbane-based curator, but who'd been living in Amsterdam for the last five years, Indian to her kind of curate a guest edited section, which was specific to the kind of social sculptural practices she was working with in Amsterdam at the time. In the second issue, uh, which is the one in the middle, in the middle on the bottom, we had the English, um, sorry, the Irish art writer and editor Maria Flusco, who edits this incredible journal called The Happy Hypocrite. She did this miniature guest edited section, which you can see in the bottom middle there, um, which was looking at animal perspectives on the on the world, and that was sort of her contribution to a, you know, a theory of contemporary art based in London at the time when she was teaching at Goldsmiths. And then in the third issue, which is definitely our most insane guest edited section to date, we had this contribution, which is that colourful rainbow set of pages by the Lithuanian curator Raimundus Malachowskis. And I still can't quite fully account for this, but for his contribution as, um, you know, onto the contemporary, he wanted to do this 40-page interview with the French actress Edith Scott, who starred in um, Leo Karatz's uh, Holy Motors. So this is this very detailed interview that goes through about 40 pages with her about playing uh, the character in that film, and also her role in the um, George Frangie film, Art Without a Face. So that's that. Um, <laughs> So in bringing together uh, these two local perspectives with each issue, we tried to create a parallax view onto contemporary Navy and onto contemporary art. So this is kind of like a decentralised view, and also it's a way of enacting that movement between localities that I mentioned before. Um, we made our first issue in 2011. We didn't have any money, and so writers and artists wrote for us for free. Um, I applied for an art history scholarship at Melbourne University where I was studying, which my supervisor assured me I would get, and I didn't get it. So um, at this point, I just got a credit card and maxed it immediately, and we paid for it you know, through our credit cards and savings accounts. And this is roughly the model we've kept in place ever since. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to publish in, uh, in discipline these long-form research essays on Australian, con contemporary Australian artists. Uh, and I mean by this, like the kinds of essays we just weren't uh, seeing anywhere else, because I guess we're all very used to the 700 word review or the 1,000 word artist profile um, that just that just feels slight in comparison to the amount of intelligence that underpins the work we were looking at. So our first issue, um, we had, I just named a few things, we had like interviews with Tom Nicholson and Raphael Ishak, um, a really great essay by Connell Parsley on Christian Thompson, um, what, what I think was some very necessary critical writing on Marco Fusinato's practice by David Homewood, and also a kind of like critical review on um, an exhibition at Y3K Gallery in Melbourne, which um, I'm not sure if it would be familiar with you guys, but it was, it was a really amazing gallery, but it had an incredibly um, sort of insider complex. It very much punished you for not being on the inside of the group of artists who were showing this. So we sort of just wanted to have an essay that took on that um, insiderism quite seriously. Um, so, sorry. in 2002, we did our, 2012 rather, we started um, also lecturing on our editorial ambitions um, to theorise contemporary art in the same way that art and text 
uh, theorised postmodernism vis-à-vis -vis Australian art in the 1980s. I did this at sort of universities and at various like symposiums. And that was a really good way of raising some revenue for paying for the next issue. Um, also in 2012, um, the Melbourne RETCV Art Inc had a last minute cancellation in their program and asked us whether we could fill it somehow. So we decided to um, we decided to sort of occupy the gallery for the three week exhibition period um, and run a kind of free school for art theory nerds there. And we so we painted up a blackboard which you can see there and we just opened up a small bookstore for independent uh, publish, art publishers like ourselves for the period. And uh, during this time we ran reading groups, um, we did lectures and discussions and some sort of conceptual musical performances. And um, a, a lot of the people who were lecturing and taking part in this were, were from the Melbourne School of Continental Philosophy. You can see Justin Clemens in that the Joseph Boy style hat in the bottom picture there, and uh, he's from MSCP, and they're a really great influence on us because they're a totally independent, alternative pedagogical project. Um, yes. So while discipline, in a way, was born out of a reading group, which was inherently a social activity, um, we tried to sort of maintain that sociality in a way. Um, through, through, you know, through programs like this where people get together and exchange ideas, because obviously writing can be quite a solitary practice, but we try and keep it a very social one where, you know, less um, alienating. And these are some of, some of these other sort of like uh, publishing activities we've done. I'm not sure if you would be familiar with the Melbourne artist Christopher L.G. Hill, but he started also in 2011 this uh, publication called Endless Lonely Planet, which you can see in the bottom left-hand corner where he asks just like a variety of um, sort of art types to contribute something. So discipline each year we've been involved in this have just tried to create a document that maps the kind of the society around discipline in a way. So we invite our contributors and um, artists to give some information. In the first one we made a discipline alphabet and everyone designed a different letter. The second one we made this to totally useless discipline high chart because at the time I was reading David Joslett's book on um, Duchamp and he, I was particularly interested in Duchamp's interest in making these useless measuring devices and I thought what would be more useless than like knowing how tall art historians were. <laughs> um, and then for the third one we made this um, calendar of birthdays and it was really interesting because I think a lot of people consider art historians to be um, really rational people, but when I emailed everyone, they, they were back saying, did you know that I was born in like the same day as John Luc Goddard and uh, we both are Scorpio Rising and that means blah blah blah. So <laughs> it was also an interesting exercise. Um, in 2013, we put out our third issue and we also established um, this, what we call like the the Gertrude Discipline Lecture Series at Gertrude Contemporary, where I now happen to work. Um, for the lecture series, we maintain the same editorial ambitions, but um, you know, theorising contemporary, contemporaneity and contemporary art generally, and looking at local artists. Um, but we slightly widened our scope of contributors, so we tried to capitalise on any international people who might be floating through uh, the country or the city and get them to speak as part of our event. Um, we tried to keep the lectures very argument driven and we don't we don't um, we try not to have anyone who gets up and gives an artist talk or an overview of the curatorial practice. And that's not to say we don't include artists and art, uh, you know curators, it's just to say that there are other forums for the show and tell style stuff and we wanted to have a forum for presenting arguments. Um, and I would say that all this sort of social activity is is oriented towards cultivating a type of culture of critique which Robert might sort of dis disagree with, but we are trying to cultivate it not at the level of um, critiquing individual artists or curators or exhibitions, but I think rather at the level of art institutions and the global industry of contemporary art itself. So you might ask, um, you know, why is this important? And I think as someone you know, living in Melbourne, it's important because um, you only have to look at the NGV, especially under the recent directorship of Tony Elwood, to recognise that contemporary art has almost become completely assimilated with the entertainment industry. And I think it's very important to think about the contours of 
contemporary art and how it might still, if it can, resist becoming t totally assimilated. Um, as well as last year's Biennale of Sydney shows, showed us contemporary art is facilitated, supported, and in turn supports capital that flows on from some of the most vile of industries, including the detention centre industry, um, you know, pre sold through Transfer and Circo and G4S and other security organisations like that. Um, and so why is it important to be independent? For us, it was important to be independent this time because not having a board and not having anyone we had to sort of seek permission from to you know, comment on this, while all the other organisations, like literally all the other key organisations in Melbourne, such as the NGV, remained silent on it, um, we were able to immediately um, and responsibly sort of start publishing on our website, uh, you know, just people who wanted to talk about this issue. So we had Nikos Papastagiatis wrote some beautiful letters and Charles Escher, the creator, and uh, Jeff Lowe, one part of Our Constructed World. It was just, it was very liberating to be able to make public these opinions that felt like they were being so silenced in mainstream media. And even non-mainstream media, like the um, stuff that was published on the conversation was totally disgusting, I felt. Like there was just no consideration of the actual left in it. Anyhow, um, as well, not having any government funding means that our issues take just as long as they need to uh, take. There's no rush and um, there's no production for the sake of production. And on the same note, it means that we're not compelled to grow our audiences for the sake of growing them, which is sort of what we see happening at the NGV through its entertainment complex. Um, we recognise that discipline has got an incredibly niche, uh, limited audience, and we're sort of content with that. Um, so if I were going to try to attempt to answer the question, um, what, what role can ARIES play in uh, art criticism, I would just say that ARIES can resist aspects of these capitalistic structures, including growth for the sake of growth, um, by standing at a remove from these large, large organisations. Um, and you know, the small scale nature can often um, you know, provide an agility in decision making, uh, which is really important for you know, avoiding bureaucracy. I really like the t-shirts outside that say, make art, not admin. Um, that's sort of all I have prepared to say for, for the meantime, but I guess to give an indication of what we have in mind for the future, um, we've just published uh, this book, uh, Free Reflections on Contemporary Art History, which is um, a small peer-reviewed uh, volume with three essays by um, Terry Smith, Emilia Barakin, and Ian McLean. And each of them responds to that book I mentioned earlier by Peter Osborne, Anywhere or Not at All. And I think we're interested in these in-between types of publications because these are much cheaper to produce given that they're digital uh, prints, whereas the discipline journal itself is, um, is deeply expensive affair. Mm -hmm. And we can also put these online very easily, so I think that's probably the direction we think.